morning, church. We invite you to stand and worship with us this morning. All the money that the world could hold, mountains made of solid gold, riches that could buy my dreams. You are better than all these things. The prettiest face to turn their eyes. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are. You're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are. Be 
Lord God, we come here today bringing all of our hopes and our joys. We come here today bringing all of our trials and our sorrows. We know that many of us are bringing difficulty and frustration into this service today, and many of us are bringing goodness and peace. And we just ask that whatever it is that we are bringing today, we would be given the grace and the courage to lay that too at your feet, to be able to lay down what we have brought with us and to put our focus on you. God, we are grateful for this opportunity that we have to be able to meet with fellow believers, to be able to hear your word, to be able to sing our praises to you, to be able to meet around your table today, God. And we ask that this would be something that you use to draw us closer to you. Today, God, we offer this time to you. 
We ask that you would be with all those who cannot be with us today, those who are traveling, those who are sick, those who are hurting. We ask that you would give them a special experience of your presence today and that they would remember even as they are not with us, they are still a part of us. God, we love you and we trust you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, St. Andrews. It is so good to be with you all here this morning. We just wanted to take a moment and welcome you all here. Uh, We want to honor the fact that you have chosen to spend this time in worship and in prayer with us. uh, And we want to, uh, we hope that this is a time that is blessed for you. We just want you to know that you are all welcome here, no matter uh, where you're coming from or how you're doing today. We love you, and we are grateful that you are here with us, especially if you're joining us online. We ask that you would take just a moment and go to sa.church and uh, find the digital connection card. Let us know that you're here. Let us know if there's any way that we can pray for you, and that's also a good place to find small groups or other ways to connect. And now would you all take just a moment and greet those around you today. All right, and as you are finishing up greeting, I'm not rushing anybody, but as you are are finishing up, we're going to take just a moment, and we are going to confess today our our common faith together in, in reciting together the Apostles' Creed. Would you say these words together with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. church. So I've got good news and bad news about the sermon today. Today's sermon is about inaugurated eschatology (laughs) and a Twitter account called Thoughts of Dog. Can you guess which one is the bad news? So confession, I chose this topic during our previous sermon series, during the honeymoon period sermon series, and so this is the sermon that a case of COVID in my household destroyed. But now that we are in September, now that we are a couple months into this ministry together and that sermon series is over, I ask you with some trepidation, does that mean the honeymoon period is over? 
Can I get a no? No, it is most definitely not. And that's because the honeymoon period is like the kingdom of God. How so? You might ask. Well, here's how. In our first two months together, we glimpsed the sweetness of the honeymoon period. We have seen how good it can be when we live together, celebrating the newness of our relationship and our shared mission. And we can choose as we go forward to live in that same sweetness in every moment. And here's the best part. In the kingdom and in the honeymoon period, every day is a new beginning. As the Bible tells us, God is about to do a new thing. And every day, and especially here at St. Andrew's, God is about to do a new thing. I'm going to tell you this. It's been a good two months. But I don't think we've seen anything yet. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so this description is also what inaugurated eschatology is all about in a nutshell. And don't worry, I'm going to tell you a lot more about it. And I promise you, Girl Scout promise, I will make this exciting. So drum roll, please. Nah, no drums. Okay. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Inaugurated eschatology, woo! Okay, okay. (laughs) All right, let's start with the eschatology bit, shall we? So eschatology is a big fancy word that means we're talking about what happens at the end of the story. Because we know that God's story and the Christian story did not end at the moment of Jesus' resurrection, nor did it end on the last page of the Bible. Eschatology is kind of looking for an end point or a fulfillment of the story that is still going on. In fact, this is the story that we all are a part of right now. Now, most popularly, this can get expressed as a kind of final judgment at the end of all time. You might be familiar with images from the Left Behind books or perhaps those amusing license plate holders that say, warning, in case of rapture, this car will be unmanned. (laughs) Or I kind of like the cheeky response bumper sticker that says, in case of rapture, can I have your car? And in those versions of eschatology, creation and people in general do not fare very well at all. Usually, most of creation is kind of wiped out and a lucky few humans are saved. But in inaugurated eschatology, this world fares much better. At the end of all things, rather than destruction, there is fulfillment of God's dream for this world. There's a kind of full realization of the kingdom of God on this earth. So rather than being headed toward disaster, we are actually headed into a future that conforms to God's preferred reality. So that's the eschatology part. The eschatology part is about what happens at the end. Now, the inaugurated part. I'm sure you've heard this word before, right? We all know what a presidential inauguration is. That's what the word inauguration means. This inauguration part, inaugurated, is about a beginning. So inaugurated eschatology is something that has already started. It has already been inaugurated. It has had its starting point with Jesus' incarnation and his death and his resurrection. See, people who believe in inaugurated eschatology believe that in Jesus, God demonstrated that God's dream for this world is going to come to fruition. In Jesus, the kind of redemption of the world was made inevitable. It will happen. All creation is going to be restored. It has started, and like a runaway train, it's a coming. But it has not yet been fully realized. The kingdom of God is already among us, but it is not yet complete. And so sometimes you'll hear theological folks talk about the already and the not yet. And that's where we live. We live in the tension of the already and the not yet. And depending upon the kind of day or week we're having, it can be easier to think about either the already or the not yet. And I think when we gather in church, we kind of like to focus on the already, and we like to remember our sort of triumphant stories, right? The, The birth of Jesus, his loving and liberating work among us, his death and resurrection, 
And we believe that Jesus both proclaimed and demonstrated that the kingdom of God is right here. It is at hand. And we know we have the potential to live in the fullness of God's presence right now. And, and sometimes when we get together, we just want to celebrate that peace and joy that is already here with us. Can I get an amen? We like to do that, amen? But still, we know it's also not yet. Because we look around the world and we look at places in our lives and we know there is a lot of suffering. We still suffer. We experience brokenness. And sometimes we cause ourselves and others immeasurable pain because we have not yet been fully transformed into the people or the world that God intends us to be. God's work of redeeming all people and all of creation is not yet finished. We're a work in progress. Creation is a work in progress. And, and we hear about this a lot in the biblical witness. I think especially about how much it's all over the New Testament. You can find it in Paul's letters, in the Gospels and other letters, the book of Revelation. In the New Testament, we hear about this kingdom of God that has drawn near but still has a ways to go. But it's not just in the New Testament. It's also in the Hebrew Bible, which we sometimes call the Old Testament as well. Now, as we approach this scripture, I want us to remember that when we talk about the Old Testament, that was Jesus' Bible. The New Testament was written after Jesus. So the Bible and the, the scriptures that Jesus would have engaged with and read and memorized and heard in the synagogue, well, well that was the Old Testament. That was his Bible. And so as a Jewish child as he grew up, Jesus would have heard these words that are from the prophet Isaiah, that God is moving us into something new. Uh, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 to 19. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So just a little context for this reading for you. Here in Isaiah, the prophet needed to remind the Judean people about God's promises. And that's because the people to whom the prophet was writing, well, they were having a pretty bad time. They were feeling the heaviness of that not yet. These words were written to the people when they were in exile. Now, do you remember how we've been talking the last few weeks about the Israelites and Exodus and how they had been moving toward the promised land? Well, the good news is they got there. They got to the promised land. And the people that Isaiah is writing to are actually their descendants. They're their, their descendants many generations after that. And by this chapter in the story, the Israelites had gotten to the promised land. They had been living there for hundreds of years, and then they lost it. The people were forcibly removed from that land and brought to a foreign country, to a place called Babylon. And their homeland had been taken away from them. And people were killed in the process. And their temple was destroyed. Their cities were ransacked. It was a real disaster for the people. And so here they sit and they're in exile. And they're fully aware of what has happened to their beloved people and their land. And at this point, they've been in exile for a while. But the writer of Isaiah, this prophet, gets a glimpse of hope. The prophet senses that things are starting to look up. The prophet sees there's hope that this other power, the Persians, might come and defeat the Babylonians, and so they, the exiled Judeans might be able to go back to their home, to their promised land. And so that's what the prophet is telling the people right here. Despite all that has happened, as bad as things might look right now, God is still at work, and God will make a way. Now, I will admit that these ancient stories can be kind of hard to relate to. I mean, none of us have ever been in exile somewhere, probably. We haven't had that experience. We're kind of thousands of years and thousands of miles away from these events. And so I'm always on the lookout for examples of what the kingdom of God, what the hope of God might look like in our world today. 
And so I want to introduce you to a Twitter account called Thoughts of Dog. Trust me where we're going here. Oh, there's Thoughts of Dog, see? So I want to start with a copyright disclaimer. I did not create Thoughts of Dog or own Thoughts of Dog, and in the spirit of making sure my use benefits the creators of Thoughts of Dog, I highly recommend you follow this feed on Twitter. Now, I don't usually do product placements during my sermon, but I guarantee this one will make your life better. It really will. So what does this dog teach us about the already but not yet kingdom of God, about the hope of God doing a new thing in every moment? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because living in the already but not yet kingdom of God is like this. First, the kingdom is about seeing the possibility for joy in every situation. As Dog says, the human just grabbed their key and my leash and they are putting on their outside feet. I do believe it is adventure time. Or this, there are so many humans in the household right now, the odds that a snack will hit the floor are the highest they have been in several years. <laughs> Secondly, the kingdom of God is about accepting the freedom to resist despair and live in joy. Dog says, it often seems like the human is jealous of me because of how happy I get about the simplest things. I don't know how to tell them. They can do that too. Third, the kingdom is about emptying yourself in love for the people around you and for the world. The kingdom of God draws near when, like Christ, we are pouring ourselves out in love for others. For example, we might just show up when we're needed. Dog says, when I was much younger, the human came with me to get my shots. They held my paw, and everything was all right. Today, I'm riding along as they get theirs. I don't think they will need to hold my paw, but I will be here just in case. Or we can pour out our love by simply being unafraid to share how much we really do care for one another. Dog is good at that, like when it's leap day, it is really cool that this year I was given a whole extra day to love you. Or on any day, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. So here's the last one and this is my favorite example of how Thoughts of Dog can help us understand the already but not yet kingdom of God. Dog says, I know there's bad in the world and it would be silly to pretend it isn't there. But for now, here's my leash and a few licks on your hand to convince you that one day we will be all right. One day we will be all right. That's the promise of God. Now, I want you to notice that this does not minimize the hardship of the world. There is real suffering. That is a fact of the not yet part of our reality. And even so, the kingdom is already here. We can still choose self-giving love and joy in every moment. And listen, I know this dog business is cute and it's fun, but I think it's more than that. It is also unapologetically joyful. It is defiantly joyful. An inaugurated eschatology is unapologetically, defiantly, and I would add radically joyful because it believes in this promise that suffering does not and will not have the last word. The hope of God for God's creation is so radical. The promise of God for God's people is so radical that the prophet Isaiah imagines its fulfillment as a party. But not just any party. The fulfillment, the promise of God we are headed for is like an amazing banquet. It's a feast for all of humanity and all of creation and everyone is there. And it is so perfect and powerful that it puts an end to all our suffering. It even swallows up death forever. Here's what the prophet writes. On this mountain, 
the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the covering that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So what I want you to know this morning is that I believe this. I believe that God has done great things and that God is doing great things in our lives as hard as it can be to see them sometimes and that God will do even greater things in the future. And I believe that we get a glimpse of that future when we gather at the communion table. You know, when Jesus first gathered his followers around this table, he said these words to them. He said, I will never again eat of this bread or drink of this fruit of the vine until I eat it again with you in the kingdom of God. And our communion today, it's a foretaste of that feast. That feast Jesus was talking about is that same heavenly banquet that the prophet Isaiah described, and it's where we all gather together when our suffering has ended and creation is made new. And when that day comes, that death-destroying feast at the end of all things, it will include everyone and every tear will be wiped away. And so you are all invited at this time to prepare your hearts to come and experience the table of paradise. And so I'm going to invite Pastor John and our communion servers to begin coming forward as we start our communion liturgy. So will you join me? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up, up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give, give our, our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to praise you, loving God. We praise you for entering the brokenness of our world in Jesus Christ for pouring out your whole self for us on the cross, for defeating the powers of sin and death through compassion and humility, and for giving yourself for us and for all of creation so that we may partake in your holy presence. God of compassion, we praise you, and with the faithful of every time and place, enjoin creation's eternal hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. With Christ, love embodied, you delivered us from brokenness and destruction and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night before he died, Jesus gathered his beloved family and friends to the table. He took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and he gave the grain of hope to the people he loved and said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over and the crumbs lay round about the table, he took the cup. He gave thanks and invited his loved ones to taste the fruit of paradise and said, Drink from this, all of you, this, the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, that in overcoming brokenness you might embrace hope. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of grape and grain. 
Make them be for us the body of Christ that we may be for the world God's people of compassion, nurtured in Christ's love, one human family. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in the full glory of compassion and we feast at the table of paradise. Through your child, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, loving God, now and forever. Amen. 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 And at this time, you are all invited to come forward to participate in this meal, this taste of the kingdom fully realized. And when we say all are invited, we really mean that. You don't have to be a member of this church or any other church. You actually don't even have to be baptized to come and participate at this table. When you come forward, we're going to give you a small piece of bread and a, a small cup of juice. It's the unfermented fruit of the vine that we take in solidarity with all of our siblings who are in recovery. If you'd like gluten-free elements, those are on the table in front of the altar here. Please feel free to grab gluten-free if that's the right kind of elements for you. If you can't come forward, we just want you to raise your hand. We'll make sure an usher finds you and we'll get those communion elements to you. What we are about is breaking down every barrier that might stop someone from participating at this table. So please let us know what the right way is for you to be part of it. And so I invite you all to prepare your hearts. And communion servers will come forward. Thank you, Sheila. The table is set. Will you come?
Would you all join me in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are so happy you chose to join us in worship today, and we hope you've enjoyed your time with us. We're glad you're here. Omaha Habitat for Humanity is in full swing building affordable housing, and St. Andrews is committed to completing faith builds throughout the year. Faith builds are when faith-filled people like you help create quality, safe, and healthy places for people to live. St. Andrews' next build is on September 16th and 17th. We can use any willing hands aged 16 years and older, no experience needed. Go to sa.church to sign up. Discover More is a series of three conversations designed to provide you with more information on what we believe and are passionate about as a congregation, providing you with the opportunity to become a member at St. Andrews. The next session will be held in person with an option to call in on Sundays after worship starting September 11th. Go to sa.church to sign up. Our next Red Cross blood drive is on Sunday, September 11th from 7 a.m. until 1 p.m. Patients in need count on drives like ours to provide a steady supply of blood, and each donation can help save up to three lives. You can sign up for a time slot by going to redcrossblood.org and search for St. Andrew's UMC, all one word, no spaces. There, you can sign up and get more information. St. Andrew's is turning 30 years old. What began as a small group home meeting to talk about forming a new United Methodist congregation has grown into a thriving community of those seeking to love God, know Jesus, and serve others. Please join us as we celebrate this milestone immediately following our regular worship service on September 18th. We are excited to celebrate with you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we want you to know that you are always welcome here. Let us know you worshiped with us by going to sa.church and clicking on the attendance link. And please join us again as we seek to love God, know Jesus, and serve others. So I'm grateful we could come to the table together today. We have tasted the kingdom of heaven here, and that should move us. It should move us to want to be part of the work that God continues to do in our lives and continues to do in our world until all of creation experiences restoration together. And that's where we are in the story. We're at that place where we are asked to do God's work in this world. And so if you want to be part of that work, you can do that by giving to this church through your time and your talent and your treasures. If you'd like to give your treasure today, you can go to sa.church and make, make an offering. You could text give. You can give in the boxes that are in the back of the sanctuary as well. There are so many ways you can give your offering and commit to be part of the work that this church is doing alongside God. And before this blessing, I want to remind you that those of you who brought your Bibles today are invited to make a video with Jay Shrigley, who's got his thumbs up in the back of the sanctuary. Um, so meet with him and bring him your Bible, and we're going to have a little video where you can be on, online, for on, on camera for like three seconds, and you don't have to say anything. Be brave, be bold, be part of that work together today. We are grateful for all of your faces because it shows us that God is working in and through all of us. And while you're out there, the blood drive people twisted my arm and said, go sign up for the blood drive as well. So can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, we're going to give lots of blood. <laughs> and I invite you now to receive this blessing. Beloved and beautiful people of God, the honeymoon period is not over. And the very kingdom of heaven is at hand. And God is not finished with us yet. So go forth with hope and go in peace. Amen. <laughs>